and our data scientists. <laughs> In this talk, I'm going to make the case that I'm one as well. But before I do that, I should probably at least define what uh, this data science thing is all about. And uh, a short definition might be just algorithms and tools to extract knowledge or insights from large volumes of data. Now, if you think about uh, the research area where I'm supposed to work, that's called formal methods. And if you want a similar definition for that area, it will be something like this, algorithms and tools to model, design, and analyze uh, computational systems that are complex. So for the purpose of this talk, I'm only going to speak about software systems. And the kinds of questions that are of interest there uh, are like this. So one question could be that, find inputs on which a given program doesn't terminate. Another could be that prove a program always satisfies some sort of a programmer written assertion. Or you could have a problem, fix the program so that it no longer violates an assertion. You could want to generate a program from a set of test cases, or more generally, some sort of a formal specification. You could, for example, want to show that a program satisfies uh, some kind of an API specification or violates something that's expected of it by an API. So over the last 30, 40 years, there's been a huge amount of work in this research area. And there's also a tremendous amount of progress. You may know that um, the researchers uh, who worked on, who invented model checking, they got the Turing Award a few years back. And more recently, there were uh, also a, a host of other tools. So for example, Facebook recently uh, released this uh, bug finding tool that was based on a lot of pretty recent programming languages and formal methods research. And what's funny is that this tool was in the media described as an AI tool. So you see that, that we are AI as well. <laughs> but in spite of all this progress that's mm -hmm. been happening, there's clearly a lot that remains to be done. In fact, if you think of the landscape of real-world software, there's this company called Coverity, which is a, a bug-finding company. And they release a so-called scan report every year, where they analyze a huge amount of software during the year, and then um, they just summarize some of their findings. And one of the findings uh, from a couple years back was that in spite of all this work that's going on on um, software correctness, the average number of bugs for a given amount of code is actually going up. So that's probably not a good situation. But, and, and perhaps the reason for that is that there's just a lot more code being written or um, code being analyzed by Coverity. Yeah? The, the, the detecting tools are also much better than to find bugs, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, this was all using their tools. And their tools haven't improved fundamentally. I would say that there have been sort of uh, heuristic improvements, but, uh, but there's not quite been a revolution in, in this kind of tools. So these are all audited tools for finding bugs that we've got. Yeah, kind of yeah. So the question then is that can we use data mining to solve some of these uh, bottlenecks that, that software analysis tools are facing? Or perhaps another way of asking this question is this. <laughs> <laughs> So the first question here that we would ask is, why would we care about data? Why is data important in program analysis? Because the traditional tool for our profession has always been logic. We view a program as a mathematical, logical object, and then we come up with all these beautiful algorithms for doing automated reasoning, and then we determine whether the program does the right thing or not, or maybe in some cases come up with programs that achieve some kind of a functionality. But I'd argue that there's actually a very real role that uh, data can play in formal methods. And one obvious place for that is specifications. Whenever you're thinking of any kind of formal reasoning, you are starting with some sort of a specification, some kind of an assertion, some kind of a pre-post condition that you want to prove. But who writes these specifications? Imagine that you're a user who is trying to write some code for the Facebook API. 
who gives you a formalization of the Facebook API? No one really. You could possibly construct one using the, the lots and lots of documentation, uh, sometimes ambiguous, that's out there, but it's going to be very, very hard. And people may not even agree that that's the right way to do things. Or maybe you want to formalize the full requirements for some sort of a complicated system, such as a self-driving car. Now this is where, perhaps, data can be of use. Imagine you're a programmer who is trying to figure out how to use a certain API, let's say the POSIX API. What you could do, perhaps, is that you could just ask the internet. And that's what we do all the time nowadays. When we write some code, when we are trying to figure out how to use an API, we go to Stack Overflow, or we go to some other sources on the internet. But suppose you had a huge data set of all possible ways in which the POSIX API could be used. Maybe you wouldn't have to manually go to Google and type some keywords in the, in the search box. Instead, you would, your tool, your algorithm, would just go and consult all that data and determine that this is really how all of these things work. This is really how all these millions and millions of people use the POSIX API. And from there, perhaps, you can come up with some kind of an, a specification of maybe not this is how it should be done, but this is how people tend to do it. So if you don't do it this way, there's perhaps something wrong with you. And another way of saying this is that correctness can perhaps be democratically elected. There is another reason for which um, I think data is really important in formal methods, and that's the question of algorithms. One thing you have to remember is that even though we make all these claims about uh, the success of formal methods tools, at the end we are really solving a problem that's pretty much impossible, at least computationally very, very hard. Even if you think of a simple program, you are going to have uh, how many possible states can that program have? A huge number. With one variable, you can have possibly two to the power of 64 states. So that's a very, very, very large number. And if you think of, say, doing synthesis, there can be just many, many, many uh, implementations of a given specification. If you want to do a proof or a bug fix automatically, again, you run into this gigantic state explosion problem, as it's called. But here again, perhaps data or the internet can come of use. So you are again this programmer who is uh, trying to figure out a way to fix their code. And uh, it again consults, he or she again consults the internet. And then this is what you get back. You get back a bunch of answers that says that, well, here's how I do it. Or to see what I do, go and look at my code. Now imagine if you had a way to just collect all the programs ever written, and you could just glean all these insights that today you are going to go to the internet to find out if an algorithmic tool could just go and learn those important pieces of uh, insight from these uh, data sets. And again, in a lot of these cases, what ends up happening is that getting the high-level idea of how to do a proof or how to implement a specification is very, very difficult. But then once you have figured out sort of a limit on the space of possible things that you're trying to find, then you can perhaps send in your brute force algorithms or your non-brute force algorithms, and your job at any rate becomes much easier. So this is all about then, how do you get important insights that are difficult for algorithms to figure out from data? So then the question is, how do you uh, collect all this data? Where do you get all this data? Well, one thing is that at a conceptual level, all programs and all proofs at the end, they are just forms of data. They are just things that you can type up in some sort of a structured format, and therefore they are data. And today, one of the things that's different from uh, 20 years back is that we have lots and lots of open source code from where we can do this kind of learning. And maybe this open source code is just going to be code. It's not going to have these other things, such as proofs or um, information about uh, how programs relate to certain logical specifications and so on. But maybe that's something we can generate. But we have something to start with. We have huge chunks of open source code from which we can learn. 
And just as an example of this, here's a plot that shows you the number of open source projects on GitHub. And this is a number that's been going up uh, uh, like crazy. And I think that since 2013, this curve hasn't really uh, flattened or anything. It's still been going up. And there was an analysis um, on uh, how many different programs are available uh, that have various kinds of functionalities. And uh, a conservative estimate is something like this, that if you think of, say, string manipulating programs, which is the bar to the far left, then there are at least 10 to the power 7 <laughs> open source programs that use string libraries in an interesting way. And uh, so one thing that you can think of then is that somebody who wants to figure out how to use a string library or who wants to debug their string manipulating code they can use all these programs and um, learn from them and, um, and do their tasks. So this was the premise, learning from code. Uh, this was the idea for uh, the DARPA Pliny project, which uh, is a rice-led project, and it's been going on since uh, October last year. And uh, the other participants in this project are uh, uh, Gramatech Incorporated, which is a company in Ithaca, New York, uh, UT Austin, and University of Wisconsin. So here are some of the team members. Uh, this photo was taken at our PI meeting earlier this summer. And uh, our dear leader is on the second row in the far left. Uh, he also <laughs> happens to be the department chair. And you see Chris is in the front, uh, and, and then I'm in the second row, and then there are all the people who actually did the work, rather than just pontificate and, and uh, have meetings. So we got a lot of publicity for uh, this project. When the project was first announced, uh, then um, there was a video that was released uh, by the Rice uh, publicity team, and then it went, maybe not quite viral, but it, was, it got a lot of visitors. And then there were all these uh, articles. So now we have really set super high expectations. We have to deliver on them. But we are working on that, as you'll see. <coughs> so this is the high-level story in the Pliny project. Uh, there's going to be a, a user interface. And I'm going to talk about that in a second. And then uh, this user interface is going to allow a programmer to just write code. It's just going to be an IDE. But the difference from a normal ID is that it's going to record everything that the user does on the cloud. And moreover, it's going to be able to use all these cloud-based tools that we have developed for doing analysis and using the results of learning and so on. And the tasks that we will support, some of them are uh, synthesis, which is how to generate a program automatically from a specification. Verification, which is you know, proving the correctness of programs. Debugging, automatic bug fixing, and so on. So this is the Pliny picture in a little bit more detail. So um, we have this whole process starts with a, a set of code corpora. And uh, here we are working with a company who has, uh, which has given us a huge amount of open source code. And in addition, we have also collected uh, a lot of repositories ourselves. And uh, there, so all this code is going to go into a compiler framework that we call the Pliny language framework. And uh, then it's going to be processed. And after it's processed, it's going to be fed into a statistical database that um, our team is building. And then when we are uh, looking at concrete programming tasks, such as synthesis or verification, the user is up there. The user is interacting with the user interface. Again, whatever he or she types that goes into the, the Pliny compiler framework. And now the, the uh, task is compiled into a foundational formal methods task, a task where you have to do some sort of reasoning about programs, except the twist is that it's now going to, uh, this foundational reasoning framework is now going to interact with the statistical database and use the results of learning. So we can see this Pliny language framework working in uh, two different forms. So one of them is the batch mode, where it's working on 
really terabytes of code. And another in the interactive mode where the user is typing a particular program and, uh, and that code is uh, uh, being analyzed or being uh, processed. So this is the batch mode view of the, uh, of the Pliny process. So you're, you're starting with, again, some corpora. And then uh, the Pliny language framework now generates a set of features that are fed into the statistical database. Now this is where the language framework that we are building is different from a traditional compiler. A traditional compiler would just aim to produce an executable. But for us, we are interested in uh, learning. And so what we want to do is to come up with these, these features or fingerprints of programs that can be then used for uh, searching and learning. And in the interactive mode, uh, the cleaning picture looks like this, that the user asks some sort of a task. And contrary to traditional formal methods, here we have under specification. So the user may not even write a whole lot. They may just write just a bunch of text and then ask the, uh, the system to go and figure it out. But say one question here could be, how should I use the POSIX API? And then the language framework, what it does is that it um, generates some goals out of this. So this is what I was telling you about the, the foundational formal methods framework. So these goals are then fed into this, this, this uh, reasoning framework. And it uses a bunch of formal methods techniques, such as um, combinatorial search, such as automatic deduction, the use of symbolic data structures, and so on, to work with this, these goals. But in addition, it now also is able to query this database and receive specifications and or algorithmic insights that it can use in doing this task. So in the rest of the uh, talk, I'm going to just go through the different components of Pliny. And then, uh, if time permits, at the end, I'm going to give you a couple of demos to show you what we've got. So the first part of this is um, the Pliny user interface. Now, it so happens that while building the Pliny user interface, we use this philosophy of Pliny, which is that if something else exists, why not just repurpose it? And so this something else uh, in included two things. One of them was uh, a system called uh, Stratacode, which was developed here at Rice as part of a different project, a project where the goal was to um, build tools that can be used in massive open online courses. And uh, the second part of this, uh, the second part of Stratacode uh, that we reused was its developer, one of its <laughs> early developer, Matt Barnett, who now uh, we are fortunate to have in our team. So the basic idea in Stratacode is that you, uh, as a programmer, uh, don't have to go and download something special. You write your code in a browser, and then you're able to run this code on the cloud. And this was developed uh, for books by uh, Alan, Scott, uh, Matt, Joe, and others. So what we did was that we just uh, repurposed this piece of code for our purposes. Now, suppose you're a programmer who's using this Stratacode ID. So you have uh, some code being written, and now, uh, in contrast to the traditional version of Stratacode, you don't really have complete programs necessarily. You don't even have necessarily something that looks like a program. So you could have some text that looks like this, which is a binary search routine, but it has missing pieces. In fact, the entire body of the while loop in this program is missing. So when you're using Pliny in, in a synthesis application, the way you would uh, use it is that you would write such a thing in the Stratacode ID, and you're going to press a button, and you are also going to give some sort of test cases or constraints that tell you uh, that tells the system what exactly you're looking for. And then um, Pliny is going to just give you back the completed program. But it's not just synthesis. We can use Pliny for repair. In fact, uh, there is an effort going on right now on this. And here, instead of starting with an incomplete program, you are starting with a buggy program. And here, there is a subtle bug. So this, um, 
low less than height expression needs to be replaced by low less equal sign. But it's something that you can use Pliny to figure out. So you can throw this incorrect program along with a bunch of test cases to Pliny, and uh, if Pliny is successful, it's going to return you the corrected program. You could also use Pliny for program verification. And this is another project um, uh, that's going on in my group. And this is led by Afsane Reva. And here, your goal is to prove a pre-post condition of this routine. And you have a formal language in which you can write this precondition and this post condition. But your goal is to find a proof. Now, for those of you who have done program verification, you know that um, the thing that's needed to do this is an invariant. You need to come up with a loop invariant that implies the property that you're trying to prove. And that's also inductive. That is, it's going to be preserved by every step of the loop. So that's, again, something that you can use Pliny to figure out. So intuitively, what's going to happen is that Pliny is going to look at some other proofs of similar programs. So maybe uh, it won't have a proof of binary search in its corpus, but maybe it will have a proof of linear search or some other um, algorithm that's relevant. And so the idea is to bring over those proofs that were applied in those settings and using that to seed some sort of a search for a proof for this program at hand. And then again, you can think of this being an interactive process. Whenever Pliny accomplishes something, the results of that, uh, that process could be again fed back into the corpus and then used for other purposes. So it's really the vision is to um, build on each other's form. So one thing here is that uh, in addition to the proof, you could also think of learning even the specification. Because if you think of it, a lot of the times you know what you want to do with a certain routine that you're writing. But there are some details, some corner cases that you may have missed out. So one thing that you can think of is you can use Pliny to figure out some of these uh, specifications that you wouldn't think of, but they seem related. So for example, if you have written a specification for what binary search should do when um, the index that you have gotten is, um, is less than 0 or, or is greater than 0. Uh, you may still have forgotten what to do when the index is less than 0. right? And then for that, a specification you could maybe get from the cloud. And uh, finally, uh, and this is one of the things that um, we are actively working on right now, uh, we could think of using Pliny to learn temporal specifications of the sort that we in formal methods have been excited about for a very long time. And uh, use it for all sorts of correctness checking, uh, repair, synthesis, and so on. And so an example here would be that, um, let's say that you want to figure out, like in my earlier example, how to use the POSIX file API. And so uh, what our system would do is that it would have a large number of programs that use this API. And it will generate lots and lots and lots of sequences from these programs that tell you what sequence these API calls actually operate on, uh, actually come in. And then we are going to learn from this massive amounts of data. And then from there, we are going to be able to come up with a statistical model, which we can then use when a new programmer wants to use the POSIX API. And um, one last thing here. So this is something that's still very uh, exploratory. We haven't concretely started working on this. But this is definitely in our mind, which is to use data in doing optimization of programs in really new forms. And so one thing you can think of here is that let's say that you have some sort of a stencil computation that's not really efficient. And then uh, you have some kind of an abstract cost model that can be used to reason about uh, performance of this computation. Sort of the, the kind that Lyserson was showing in his talk uh, from a, a week or two ago. So you can think of throwing this to Pliny. And Pliny maybe has access to lots and lots of other um, programs. And it knows how those programs were parallelized or optimized. And you can think, it, you can think of learning some sort of a model of parallelization or optimization from all, the, all that data, and then maybe bringing back something that's of use here. 
maybe not directly, but maybe it can start the search for uh, some of these optimizations. So these are some of the problems that we are working on. I won't have time to go into the details of all of these. I'll show you a little bit at the end. But in the, uh, for the next 15 minutes or so, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the core uh, components of, of Pliny. And the first of this is the, the compiler and language framework. So here, as I said, our input is uh, a whole lot of code coming from uh, all sorts of internet repositories. And the output, these are little pieces of code, which we call program elements. So these are our atoms in our learning process. And these could be uh, lots of different things. These could be uh, you know, procedures. These could be data types. These could be classes. These could be sequences of calls, as I just mentioned. Um, but all of these different things, they uh, come with, uh, or, or all these elements, they come with some features. Okay, So these are the features that are going to be used in learning. And when you have these features, then you also have um, some similarity measures defined on them, which allows you to tell whether two procedures, let's say, they are close to each other or, or not. OK, so you can see where this is going. Because if I could take two procedures, extract a bunch of features from them, and then compute similarity between them, I can then figure out that procedure one seems similar to procedure two. And in that case, suppose you have a programmer who is working on procedure one. They can query the database, and database can figure out that here's this other procedure, procedure two, which seems relevant. Here, take it. Maybe you can find it. Maybe you'll find it to be useful. So um, here are uh, a few features that that we have considered, uh, and and I'm going to give dive deeper into one of them, but. Um, one of them could be just the, the skeleton of the program, of the, of the program element. So let's say that you have a procedure. OK, you can generate some sort of a structural skeleton out of this. Is there a loop that's there at the top level? Is there a nested loop? Is there an if-then-else inside a loop? Are there two nested loops followed by something else? So this is not complete information by any means. But oftentimes, something as basic as this can let you rule out a lot of candidates. And that's what we are trying to do when we are doing search. We are trying to rule out things that are, that are not relevant to us as quickly as possible. So some other things could be, say, type signatures. So if you know that a function has a certain type, you would probably be looking for uh, you know, functions that have the same type or, or similar types. And so that's another uh, kind of feature that you can define. We have already talked about API uh, sequences. You can talk about the kinds of constants that are being used. So suppose you have a, a, a function that uses the constant pi. That actually tells you a lot about this function. That tells you that it's unlikely that this function is coming from, let's say, a low-level device driver. So that's another thing. We could collect uh, a bag of constants from a procedure or other kinds of program elements. And so here is one of them that we uh, found to be uh, intriguing as well as useful. So this was developed by our uh, colleagues at uh, Grammatech and at University of Wisconsin. So here the idea is that you are um, abstracting or modeling a program, uh, a procedure as follows. So you are generating a control flow graph. And from this control flow graph, you are producing a bunch of subgraphs. And in fact, the size of these subgraphs has been set uh, magically to four. Somehow that seems to work. So you create these four subgraphs. And so a program becomes a bag of subgraphs. And then that's what you use as your feature. For the distance metric, you use some sort of a distance metric over these um, subgraphs. And then you aggregate them into one over the, the, the bag of subgraphs. And then this graph didn't have to be the control flow graph. It could be something else. It could be a dependence graph amongst variables. It could be um, all sorts of other things. So this is what the feature extraction phase of uh, Pliny looks like. 
you take in a whole bunch of code in the batch mode or a single program in the interactive mode and you generate these features that all go into the database. But what is this database? So this is something that was, that's being um, led by uh, Chris's group here. And uh, the high level point uh, is to permit large scale machine learning on these features generated from programs. And so the kinds of machine learning algorithms, we want to be as flexible as possible. And uh, some of these are uh, k-nearest neighbors. So this is a very basic thing that we need. We want to, uh, given a procedure, find out uh, what other procedures are, are similar to this one. Uh, we are looking at Markov random fields. So this, is, uh, uh, this turns out to be extremely useful in this problem of prediction of uh, API calls and, and just learning API specifications. We are using hidden Markov models. Actually, um, Rohan, Chris, a student who is here somewhere, is uh, there. Uh, he is leading the effort on this, him and, and my postdoc, we did. But what's interesting is that we found out that in order to do this, we couldn't just use some sort of an existing big data system. We had to invent our own big data system. And this is uh, a new distributed object store and compute platform that's um, uh, colloquially known as PDB or PliniDB. Although it's not just a traditional database, it's a bit more than that. So the goal over here is that we want to have it both ways. We want to have the flexibility of something like Hadoop or Spark, meaning that we want programmers to be able to go and allow uh, user-defined types and user-defined computations, but at the same time, we want to have the performance of traditional relational databases. And um, probably this is something that uh, Chris should talk about in a future talk in more detail, but um, uh, the reason why we couldn't just use any of these uh, standard relational databases is that um, the kinds of data formats and data layouts that they permit are pretty restricted. So we want to be able to use schemas that are lists, that are graphs, that are trees, because these are the kinds of things that come naturally out of programs. And these are things that are not so naturally supported by traditional relational databases. But at the same time, we want to have it both ways. So we want to have the kind of control over data layout and movement that's available in a relational database. On the other hand, if you think of something like Hadoop or Spark, these are, as they call it, schema never, as in there is no schema, and as a result, you lose a lot of this fine-grained control, and as a result, performance tends to suffer. And so the kinds of things that we would like to do with this system are, as I said, over there. I want to have feature types that include lists and graphs and trees and so on and so forth. And I also want to have user-defined computations implemented very, very easily. And this should include at least top case similarity search and gradient descent and hidden markup models and, and many, many more. So this is sort of what the, uh, the PDB programming model is. So you have a cloud-based cluster where uh, you have this distributed object store implemented. And then all these types and all these queries, these are implemented as C++ classes. Okay, so it's completely um, uh, flexible in that sense. There is no special query language. There is no SQL. Um, there is no X query, anything like that. It's really just C++ code that's being run on the database. And this is something that we can use in other ways too, although we haven't done it so far. At the end, this system is not just a database. It's, it's something that, it's, it's just a large scale distributed computing platform. And so one can think of even running large-scale program analysis on PDB or doing large-scale combinatorial search, for example, model checking on PDB. And these are some of the things that we definitely want to explore in the years ahead. So now that I've talked about the, the statistical uh, part of Pini, let's talk about the formal methods part of Pini. And this is the part uh, that I'm leading. And uh, here, as I said before, the fundamental task uh, is to uh, do some kind of a mathematical logical problem. 
And the Pliny language infrastructure, it allows us to take a task specified at the programmer level in the form of code and convert it into this sort of a foundational mathematical task. And what I'm going to show you now is how do we solve this foundational mathematical task using information from the corpus. So uh, at the basis, at the, at the root of it, most of these tasks that we do in formal methods, they can be reduced to uh, this one question, which is that of synthesizing mathematical functions. And so for us, the goal is going to be something like this. So we want to find a mathematical function or a set of mathematical functions that satisfy a given set of logical constraints that's being given to us from somewhere else. Moreover, these functions should be expressible in a syntactic space that is built out of stuff that's there in the corpus and also some uh, additional predefined operators. And finally, we want this uh, thing that we produce, this mathematical function, to be optimal according to some sort of a quantitative criteria. And uh, I'm going to talk about uh, why those three things in a second. But the high level idea is to solve this problem using a combinatorial search in the space of all possible functions, all possible lambda expressions. But this combinatorial search is complemented by some serious automated deduction and also information that we get back from uh, the Pliny statistical framework. So uh, now to get back to uh, this, this question, uh, why is this problem meaningful? So let's take a very concrete application of um, synthesis. So here you would have, um, you're starting with some sort of a programmer level task. You have some in incomplete piece of code and you have a set of test cases. Now what you want to do is to find a completion of the code so that the test cases pass. All right? So now uh, one thing is that aside from the user supplied tests, you also have a set of basic invariants that are just language invariants. So you don't want uh, a code to be produced which has divide by zero errors or null pointer exceptions. So there are a set of logical constraints that are just coming from the language. And then there are some additional logical constraints that may come from the user. And again, as I said, those will be compiled down to um, foundational logical formulas by your compiler framework. So that's where the, the logical constraints come from. Now, as for uh, requirement two, this sort of makes sense because the whole purpose here is to reuse information that's already available in the corpus. And so uh, if we are seeking algorithmic insights, what we could think of is that, let's say we are doing synthesis, um, to fill the gap in the code that we have, we may need to use a set of functions. We need to compose them in some way. But let's say that the implementations of those functions are already available in the database. We don't want to search for them from scratch. We want to use the implementations that are already there. And that's why we want to find a completion that's going to be uh, a function that's built from corpus components. And as for the third criterion, uh, one reason why you may be interested in a quantitative requirement is parsimony. You want to find uh, a completion of your code that's as simple as possible. So that's already a quantitative uh, goal that you have placed. But you can think of other things. You can think of something probabilistic that's based on the knowledge that's already available in the database. So for example, you have a, a, a binary search where there are some missing uh, expressions. So now, you know, maybe, and, and this is because the search algorithm doesn't know anything, right? Maybe it thinks that hey, maybe I can use GCD in order to, um, to uh, fill this gap. And maybe there is no evidence uh, to the contrary based on just the information that's available. But perhaps the database already has this knowledge that when you are trying to fill um, a hole in a program that looks like a binary search, then you don't tend to use things that look like GCD as components. 
So in that case, the database could just give you back some results, these components, along with some weights, capturing how likely they are to be useful. And that's something that we can factor into this, this, uh, this reasoning task. We can uh, make our goal to be, you know, find a completion that fits the test cases and is also likely to be useful. And the reason why we have to constantly talk about likely is because we are working with under specifications. This is not the traditional formal methods world where everything is given to you, you just go and churn your theorem prover. We, know, we don't know a lot of things. We are trying to read the mind of the programmer. And that's where this quantitative criterion turns out to be useful. So here's a high level view of the um, search that we are doing. So the kind of search that we are doing is known as refinement based search. <coughs> and the idea here is that you are operating in a space of partial programs. So the way to see this picture is that you are starting at the root of this tree. And at the root of this tree, there is no code here, just for simplicity. In general, there may be some code already available. So that's that big red box. It's a hole. We want to fill that hole. So the way this search progresses is that it goes down uh, the search tree, and it adds some more information. So here I'm working with a language of lambda expressions. And this is, by the way, something that was developed by uh, Jack Fezzer, who used to be an undergrad here. He is now a master's student. We just had a PLDI paper uh, on this with Jack as the lead author. So um, here I have this, this hole being gradually filled. So on the two left-hand uh, boxes, we have this hole being replaced by, in one case, a function that takes in any argument x and just returns the empty list. And another one that returns the identity function. Possible. But then you have another. Uh, descendant, another child of this top level node, where maybe you have filled in a little bit of code. Maybe you have put in a map combinator. But there is still some other stuff that you don't know. You don't know what is the argument that's being supplied to this map combinator. You know, what's the function that's going to be applied as a map? And so on and so forth. So if you have a situation like this, then you have to go down the search tree and you have to fill that bit as well with something else. And this is just going to go on until you have just a big, large space of uh, concrete programs. So the way you can use database queries is that now, while you're filling that red box, <coughs> that red hole, you can use some uh, information from the database as, as pre-compiled components. And so here I have these two uh, green boxes, which correspond to functions that the database is suggesting that we could use. And in fact, <coughs> as I said, with these functions, there could also be an additional uh, weight. So here I'm saying that one of them is given a weight 0.3, and the other one is given a weight 0.7, which means that the search algorithm should probably go and, and take the right-hand one before it does the left-hand one. And there is a nice probabilistic interpretation of all of this, uh, which we almost worked out, but um, uh, I, I won't talk about that at this point. And then there is also a lot of automatic deduction that's happening. Uh, I'm not going to go into details in the interest of time. But the high level point is that if you have some sort of a goal that you are trying to solve, right? so there is a goal for which you want to find a function. So you can think of, as you are doing this kind of um, branching, as you are doing this kind of enumeration, you could think of doing some deduction and pushing these goals down the search tree. And this turns out to be very, very useful. Because in some cases, you can just derive a conflict pretty early on and just decide that, OK, this branch of the search tree is not going to go anywhere. Let's just kill this branch. And this is how you prune, and this is how you, you know, backtrack uh, more efficiently. So this, by the way, is something that's, that's parallel to stuff that happens inside SAP solvers. And that's one of the connections that we are very excited about. We are uh, avidly exploring this at this point. So now. Uh, that I have given you most of the, all these components, let's talk about a few concrete um, applications. And um, so here uh, I have um, this um, code completion example. And let's see if uh, I can show you a demo, which this work is uh, led by my student, Yan Chin Lu. And here is this binary search program where you have lots of missing pieces. And uh, your goal here is to uh, complete it. Now, this is not very fast at this point. So 
while this runs, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna show you <laughs> I'm gonna show you how uh, the internals work, and then I'm gonna go back to the results. So the basic idea is as before: you are um, you are starting with a corpus, and then it goes to the feature extractor, and it goes to the statistical framework, and so on and so forth. So uh, upon being given a draft from the user, what this reasoning framework does is that it queries for five similar programs from the database. And the database is doing a not very smart KNN search using uh, this corpus that we are starting with. And that has three million uh, functions uh, at this point. There will be more. So from all this, uh, after you um, run this, you get something like uh, this over here. You see that this program has been magically completed while we were uh, waiting. And it took altogether uh, around, uh, I would say, 15 seconds or so. And the process, uh, I'll just show you the trace a little bit. So you're starting with this template. So let's focus on the right-hand side of this picture. So you're starting with this incomplete code. And then uh, you are getting a bunch of programs from PDB. And you see that now, here, I have a program whose name is a little bit different from what I had over here. And also, the argument is a little bit weird, the arguments. So the second argument, in particular, seems to be an array of size 100, somehow. Um, but we have no guarantees whatsoever about what kind of programs exist in, uh, in the database. So we have to just work with what we have got. And then the next program is even more interesting. So this one has just a single element as the, sorry, um, this one over here. It has just a single element as argument. So there is no array, and it's, it seems very strange. Where is this data coming from? So it turns out that this is coming from somewhere else. This has been, this data array has been defined somewhere else as a global variable, so, but that's what we got. We have to work with it. But the nice thing is that after we get back all these programs, uh, even though a lot of them may seem like complete garbage, they still turn out to be useful. Because they all contain some of these high-level insights, which we can extract. And we are not saying that we are going to use them wholesale, right? We are going to take them, extract these high-level insights, and use that to guide our uh, search. And um, just to carry on with this, uh, I'm not actually going to, well, maybe I should. I was going to say I, I'm not actually going to switch between this mode and, and the other one, but this is just repair. Uh, this is the place where you had a, a, a bug. Uh, in the in the code, and now uh, what we'll do is that we'll take this program that we we got back from um, from Pliny, and we are going to throw the repair algorithm at it. And the basic idea over there is um, so. Let's see. Uh, let's do this. Do this. Okay, I'm just going to keep it like this. So the basic idea over here is that now, in addition to finding candidate completions from the database, you're also trying to find some sort of a, an idea of where the bug is in your code. And the way you do that intuitively is that you get a bunch of similar programs. And then you see, where, is the, where are these programs different from the program that I wrote? If the program that you wrote seems slightly different in a way, uh, in the same way from all these programs, it's possible that that's where the bug is. And then you use this information to generate, um, to punch some holes in your buggy code, if you will. And then you get back an instance of the older problem. And uh, then this is what we got over here. I had changed the condition of the while loop, and now it's been uh, switched back to less than equals. So another uh, task is that of um, learning API specifications. Uh, and here, okay, I'm just going to go back to this. And here, the um, idea is that you want to learn properties like this, that you should only read from a file that has already been opened. Or you don't want to read and write into the same file. And this is, again, not something that's going to be given to you by, by any omniscient programmer. It's just going to be what happens in reality. And, and we'll find those patterns from there. So the high-level picture uh, of this is that uh, you have, a, again, a corpus. And from the corpus, you generate a very large number of call sequences. 
uh, calls to these sorts of API methods. And in addition, actually, we also learned some constraints among the arguments of these calls, which is what makes our, that's one of the things that makes the statistical model here somewhat interesting. And then it goes into this learning process, and then when the user is writing some sort of an incomplete program, you generate, again, an incomplete call sequence from there. So this is going to be a call sequence with some, some holes. And then using the statistical model, you do prediction. And the model that we use happens to be a markup random field, but of a special sort, where there is this ability to reason about Boolean predicates as well. So uh, this is my last demo, I promise. And um, here, you have this. Uh, disaster of a program. It's not actually that bad, it's just that this interface is not the best way of showing it. So this is a, the GNU head program, okay, a available in core reports. And so if you um, look at the uh, end, so I see that there are calls to all these Unix methods like, you know, exit, and there is a close over here. So let's say what happens if I close, replace this, this um, um, close method this close API call, and also this exit API call by uh, Pini fill, which is our notation for holes. And um, I have to just get rid of this. I have to just get rid of this. Okay, for this, I didn't mess up anything. No, I don't think so. API predict, this thing um, goes and um, runs and what it tells you is that so here you are sh seeing some iterations of git sampling. The last one is where you want to look at. So here what you're finding is that uh, in line 1064 you need to type in exit, that's the right call. And in line number 1061, which is the first one over here, the right call is close. Okay, and, and the way this process starts, it starts by making random guesses, so it, has, it starts by guessing that you know, the second one is closed and the first one is MEM RCHR. And there, from there, using the model, it iteratively gets to this point where um, it reaches the right prediction. And this is something uh, that's being led by my postdoc Vijay Murali and, and uh, also in a related project by Rohan. And so you should ask them questions if you are, uh, if you are interested in knowing more about this. Okay, so I'm at the end of my talk, but I'm going to just give you some takeaways. So the first takeaway is, of course, that formal methods and big data should fall in love. And there's a lot of work to be done here. Uh, it's a whole new playground for research. There is very, very little work in this. This is something that's uh, really, uh, there are a couple of efforts that are going on in Europe right now. But aside from that, we are the only ones in the world who are working on this problem. And what, I, what really excites me about this is that this is really a bridge between logic and statistics. Now, people in AI have wanted to bridge logic and statistics for a long time for different reasons. But over here, there is another very applied uh, problem where uh, there is such a, an opportunity for such a bridge. And there are lots of algorithmic and engineering challenges too. And finally, uh, we are going to release the first version of this as we, uh, this is something we decided on just yesterday, uh, <laughs> at the end of April. At least this is what Chris and I think should happen. And now it's the people who will do the actual work. They have to figure out you know, <laughs> by that time. But that's it. That's all I have to say. When you say release, are you going to release the source on GitHub, or are you going to actually release a tool people can start using? We'll release it on, uh, well, we'll want to release the code on GitHub and also um, you know, it's going to be an open source system, so people should be able to use it as well. So there'd be like a website you could go to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah? So very quickly at the top, the first thing that you told us, or one of the first things, was the statistic that over the years, the number of bugs in code has been going up. So how does that play into the fact that you're going to be pulling all of your code from the internet. So this is saying that as time goes on, the data is getting worse and worse. <laughs> yes, How do you but, to that? but here's the thing. So I think that the, uh, so part of the, uh, so I, I, if you think of where this system would be used. So 
the original vision of this, this program was to use all the code in the whole world. But it's not clear to me and a lot of others that that's necessarily going to be the best use case. One way in which you can think of using a system like this could be that say you are Facebook or you are Microsoft. You have your in-house code base where there are uh, lots of code, lots of programs written by competent programmers and, and tested and debugged in a nice way. Um, that's all there and you are trying to learn from this. So then you are not learning from just complete garbage that people spew, but you are learning from some um, uh, code that has some quality. And the second point is that, uh, yes, it's true that the defect detect, the, the, at least according to that statistics, the, the defect density is going up, but it's still not super high. If you think of the, uh, the statistic, it's about you know, 0.6 or so in a, 0.6 bugs in a thousand lines of code. And then we have to also talk about what kind of bugs these are, how serious these are, and maybe you know, some kind of code we just shouldn't use, but maybe it's, there are some classes where this could be useful. Okay, your point about using internal code makes sense to me simply from a legal standpoint. That's true. Like licensing issues, there's no yeah. way you're just gonna be able to go and pull code off the internet and use that to write your code. That's well, it's unless the code is open source and you are building open source code as well. Even then, there's going to be so many license compatibility issues. Sure. Yeah? What about the dependency between uh, uh, the data sets? I mean, suppose that, that uh, you just generated a, a code, new code using your system, then it is dependent on the code from which you you just you just cured. So do you assume some dependency model that you can slowly uh, use? Well, at this point, we are just uh, taking code that's out there in the internet and um, building new things out of that, but not releasing, not putting those programs back in the same pocket. So at this point, there is no cyclical dependency. Uh, but that's something interesting to think about. It's a very impressive project with a lot of ambitious goals. So I have a suggestion for something to do that's simpler, but I would be personally be impressed as hell if you could do it in a reasonable way. This reminds me a lot of you know Google search in its infancy. And you know, a lot of the things that you're doing, you're just saying I'm gonna be able to search the world's database for relevant code. Right. And like, you know, for example, just worry about bad code. I'd be fine. If you show me bad code that's related to what about that, so maybe interesting for lots of reasons. Maybe. Right. I, I'm not trying to find code, I'm just trying to find like, you know, who's working on people. I think that the things that Google Search faces, a lot of those issues, the same thing you're going to have to face. Like, how do I go between different languages? You know, everything right now is going to be in a single language. Yeah. Um, you know, how do I deal with incomplete specifications? Yeah. You know, learning to use you know, searches in Google and those that have a lot of things with. Well. But I think that you could build something that would blow people away. If you could just build me a website I could go to and type in code and literally pull up you know, existing code and translate it to whatever my favorite language That may exist, maybe I'm not knowledgeable about that, but me running these moves, something like that would be like that. Yeah. Yeah, so the so code search is definitely a very important part of this project. And in fact, um, that's one of the benchmark problems that we have mm -hmm. uh, in, in phase one. But it's in a very restricted setting. It doesn't deal with these n, this n language problem, which is just a huge pain, right? Because we have to then talk about all this infrastructure in all these languages, and it's just something we didn't look at. Um, but if you are, but as, if you can put aside the language, the n language issue for a single language, I think we will have something um, reasonable by the end of this project. So how do you define reasonable? Because people by like Google search they think it's reasonable. I'm not sure how they know it's reasonable. But I, one of the one of the things is being the first is you don't yeah. have anything to be compared against. Yeah. But as soon as there's Google and Bing, people are going to be comparing. To yeah. You. So some of our partners they are actually looking into this problem. They are trying to define metrics uh, that would make sense. So one thing that you could do is that you could inject some new code into the corpus and then see whether you can recall uh, that code uh, uh, from this gigantic corpus, right? So that's something that, so they have some pretty impressive numbers on that. Uh, but again, it's very narrow in scope at this point just because this has only been going on for a year or so. Would you like to comment more on the optimization We don't have it. We are just—it's just a vision. Yeah. So the idea would be that if you have seen how a 
a lot of stencil computations can be parallelized or optimized for parallelization, then maybe you can reuse some of that knowledge for, um, for the new problem. So one example I'd give is that if you think of you know, how the, this fastest Fourier transform in the West, uh, this came out of Lysosun's uh, lab, how that works. So it creates a bunch of these codelets, as they call it, which are little snippets of code that have been produced in a separate phase. And then, dynamically, it stitches together these, these um, codelets in a smart way to accomplish some performance goals. So one can think of doing something along those lines, but we have really no idea how to actually do it. This is just uh, very high level. Uh, there we go. So, very nice. A lot of your, um, a lot of your uh, ability to search depends on this database and features for this writing program. Yeah. Yeah. How powerful do you think they are? And sort of what is the outer limit? So where do you have to go to get it to the next sort of level? Right. So like yeah, so we don't know the full answer to that yet, of course, but um, the idea is to just create any feature that seems reasonable. And then the learning algorithm um, itself is able to weight the features mm -hmm. in an appropriate way and then um, and, and so then that decouples the two processes that, yeah. But I don't know the answer to that question really, that how far can we go right. with this? Are there more semantic features that you think you may have to build? Because when I think about, um, I mean, this is like a, a cap and paste game, right? Yeah. You gotta think of what you want to build and what you want to learn. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So a lot of it is very contextual. Yes. And so I'm trying to, features are, I assume, trying to capture that. Mm -hmm. contextual right. thing. Right. It's not like you can you know, grab a, a bike from here and stick it in right. through morning. Right. It's a little more complicated. Absolutely. So the main bottleneck there is uh, computational complexity because at the end you are working on a giant database and you don't want to say run SAT solvers on this uh, giant database. So right. So what you, so, but what you, what we want to do is to explore the trade-offs between precision and, and performance. So um, one thing that comes to mind is that, so let's say that you are thinking about binary search, right? So uh, binary search assumes a sorted array. Mm -hmm. So if you have a routine that is uh, called in this context where there is a, first a call to something that kind of sort of looks like a sort, and then there is a flow into this other routine, that suggests something. Now, maybe you can use that information. In fact, what's funny is that when we wrote the proposal, uh, we used this as an example that we'll use some bounded contextual information around the, the current point, the current element as part of the feature. Yeah, so when you talk about the refinement search, you know, I yeah. can see your search space explode, yeah. and I'm wondering how you're going to control that yeah. process. Yeah, so the, the, right now the approach is that you do lightweight things in the, in the learning process, uh, but then when you are looking at uh, the actual task at hand, you have a one uh, program that you're working with, and then you throw all our formal methods techniques, which can be potentially very heavyweight. Yeah. 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 Uh, so right now, Pini looks at the, like the corpus that Pini works on is like one version of the final output code, right? So does it make sense to look at multiple revisions, like the way the programmer came to the final version? Yeah, that's a very good question. So in fact, um, one of my postdocs, Hassan El Dib, uh, is Hassan here? Yeah. yeah. So he's looking at this exact problem. Um, and um, so the goal there is to learn from patches. So if you have, say, a whole bunch of security patches uh, that where you see the old version, you see the new version, and you see the delta, could you learn from that what are the conditions under which this patch was applied? And if you can do that, then you can think of when you have a new program, you know, uh, something that looks like a hard bleed but maybe is not quite exactly that. But you can at least start from this, um, uh, this knowledge of how you patched Heartbleed. And then it still doesn't solve the whole problem. You have to do some kind of uh, program analysis and formal methods, but your job becomes easier. Yes? Well, me? I, know, I know your question, I think, but. <laughs> no, 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 Never again. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> no, no. So I actually have a very related question to that. Yeah. I wanted to use Heartbleed as a specific example. Um, 
I want to put you in an alternate universe where Heartbleed hasn't been discovered. Yeah. And then Plenty succeeds. What is the impact of Plenty on that world? We get lots of money. <laughs> so you, I mean, you think you could, if, if Heartbleed hadn't been discovered, you think Plenty would discover it? Or if we sick Plenty on the code base, it would find it? Do you think that, I mean, across all the noise of all the bugs you might find, do you think it would recognize that it's a significant problem that needs to be brought to the attention of humans? I don't know. So Heartbleed, the thing is, it's not a particularly complex error. So I can't imagine that something at least somewhat similar to that hadn't been there. But that said, I wouldn't make such a claim that uh, you know, Pliny would have just, if only we had Pliny, then there would be no Heartbleed. Right? Because that's something that's completely unsubstantiated. Yeah? So your examples are all sequential code. Yes. So, of course, parallel code has much more complex invariants. So are there, like, suppose I wanted to synthesize lock-free data structures. Have you given any thought to what it might take to extend these ideas? So the problem there is that um, I don't know how much data is available uh, for lock-free data structures. Yeah. So it's an interesting question because maybe even though there is less data, there may be only a few ways in which these things are done. Um, but at the end, I think that the, sh that the shortage of data will definitely uh, hit us over there. Yeah, but like the, you know, the, the markup models and like looking for the, the sequences, that, that sort of breaks down if there's like yeah. a whole set of partially ordered things. Yeah, so we are actually, uh, so Vijay and, and Tiago and Jisheng are looking at um, uh, the problem of learning specs from MPI code. So uh, there the observation is that uh, MPI, first of all, there is more code perhaps than log free data structures. Sure. But also it's, um, uh, mm -hmm. there are lots of syntactic restrictions that people tend to follow. So the hope is that you could learn some kind of specs from there and then use that for doing just debugging. And uh, that would already, from what I understand, be pretty significant. And then about synthesis, I, I was talking to Lisserson when he was visiting. And um, he told me to look at silk code. And the idea would be that just as you know, today we are using this top-down search, we are generating these structured programs. You could think of generating you know, proc join programs uh, and, and use some kind of an abstract cost metric like what he was talking about to guide the search. Sure. Work in depth and develop yeah. concrete. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah? You already got one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. 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 Not necessarily parallel programs, but asynchronous programs where the, the control flow of the dependencies aren't really expressed in your straight line code or conditionals, but more in like callbacks past other functions or event objects and things like that. Do you think you can handle those or would you have to kind of hard code support for certain models? So I think that's going to be a much harder problem, but maybe the way to contain the complexity is to just um, start with some sort of a DSL or some kind of a specification from the programmer and then have uh, Pliny work on relatively small sub-problems of that. That would be my suggestion for a starting point. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> so you brought this binary search example up a couple times. Yeah. So first when I see that, what pops into my head is, who writes binary search? Nobody writes binary search, except for intro to CS students. So yes. how do you see this affecting intro to CS education? <laughs> you know that expression about everybody being above average? Here everybody will get 100. That's, that's the future of intro CS education. <laughs> <laughs> serious answer. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's, um, maybe Pliny can also be used for plagiarism detection, for example. I can think of that as one thing. But, okay, so that's, um, so, so more, okay, so if you're assuming that question. there is... So do you think that in intro to CS classes, people will still write binary search? Or will Pliny have supplanted the need to learn how to write these basic algorithms? I think people should always write binary search. Because the thing that you learn from there is, it's not just about you know, using binary search. It's about understanding how algorithms work. And 
Yeah, I think it would be guideline. Yeah. I mean, I teach a million students, and if you had a tool like this, as I mentioned about the Google search thing, you don't have to have all the stuff he's got to get people's attention out there. But I will say that, the, that if I was going to be skeptical, like I was on a dark review panel, it's a lot of good high-level stuff, but the key is reliability like this. But, you know, it's, it's one of those things that if the student was going to use it, the student would be very excited about it until it gave that really bad answer. And then all of a sudden they'd be like, you know, I mean, an expert can handle a bad answer because an expert will recognize, oh, this is just, it failed, it didn't do a good job. But a student needs much higher reliability. Yeah. But I think a tool like that would be awesome. I think it'd be something that would really improve the way students learn about how to code. Yeah, and another thing you can think of is repair, right? So a lot of the time students are stuck with a bug and they just don't have any way out. So here you can think of using the repair functionality to get some feedback on what went wrong. And again, binary search is just meant to be an example. It's not meant to be a real thing. I'm not going there. <laughs> this is also another step in making us more like a specifier, so there's programmers, right? And this is the process of synthesis. Yeah. And, and understanding the specification and how do I go specification, this is the next challenge. Sure. But also, there also you can think of getting some help from the world, right? Like if you <coughs> cover 10 cases of a specification but not the remaining five, maybe those can be learned from the data. Okay. Okay. So, thank the speaker once again. Thank you for